For those of you who don't know me, I'm Diane Kresh. I am the director of libraries, but I'm also the convener for WOW, which is Women Work, and it's an employee resource group uh, for women leaders in Arlington County. It doesn't mean that men cannot participate in the programs or participate in some of the workshops, uh, but it is uh, an opportunity to create fellowship and networking and role modeling and mentoring for women leaders at whatever stage of leadership they are. Because the goal is to attract and retain the best women leaders that we can. So we started uh, WOW earlier this year. There are over 100 people on our mailing list. We have events, we have workshops, we have happy hours, we have lunchtime conversations where you just come as you are, and if you've got an issue, great, and uh, Ann Gable has a book club. <laughs> Not really. Uh, we hope to have a book club. Uh, but anyway, thank you all, because I think, I think the fellowship and the networking and the problem sharing and just knowing that there are other people out there in the workforce who think as we do and have some of the same challenges and uh, stresses, I think is uh, rewarding in itself. So again, thank you. So uh, today we're delighted to welcome our speaker, Commissioner Hai Feldblum of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. She was one of the creators of the original Employment Non-Discrimination Act and is a strong voice for LGBT plus rights. She began her service as a commissioner of the EEOC in April of 2010. During her service on the commission, she has focused on employment civil rights issues, including employment of people with disabilities, pregnancy accommodation, sexual orientation and transgender discrimination, harassment prevention, the structure and process of the federal sector complaint system, and strategic planning for the commission. Prior to her appointment to the EEOC, Commissioner Feldblum was a professor of law at the Georgetown University Law Center, and she founded the Law Center's Federal Legislation and Administrative Clinic, which represented a range of organizational clients focused on social justice. She also founded the Workplace Flexibility 2010, a policy enterprise focused on finding common ground between employers and employees on workplace flexibility issues. She has played a leading role in helping to draft and negotiate the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 and the ADA Amendments Act of 2008. She has also worked to advance lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights. Commissioner Feldblum is the first openly lesbian commissioner of the EEOC and is the fourth person with a disability to serve on the commission. She clerked for Judge Frank Coffin of the First Circuit Court of Appeals and for Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman after receiving her JD from Harvard Law School. She received her BA from Barnard College. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Feldblum. Thank you. Thanks so much. I think usually that bio is shorter, but thank you. So number one, I want to give a shout out for WOW, um, for Diane, for all the other people who have started WOW, because part of why I'm here is because of networking, is because of knowing folks who then knew folks who knew me. And I was like, I'm going to come out and talk to this group. So I am all about, from the happy hours to the lunches, I absolutely believe that the networking is key. OK. So what I want to do is talk mostly about the work we've been doing on harassment prevention. Because there, I feel the EOC has actually taken a potentially transformational role in terms of making change. So I'm going to spend most of my time on that. I want to make a few comments about other things we're working on. Um, when I say the EEOC enforces Title VII, the anti-discrimination law in employment, what that means is everyone has to come through our doors first to file a charge of discrimination, employment discrimination, before they can go to court. So they have to come through us. The plus about that is they don't need lawyers, and we often can get relief for people in confidential settlements before anyone goes to court. 
But because Congress has never actually resourced us to the extent we need, the timelines are just absurdly long in terms of sometimes getting relief. So after a period of time, we can just give the person, if the person has a lawyer, which is the best, a right to sue to go to court. Um, obviously, you don't need a lawyer to go to court either, but it's better if you have a lawyer. So we try to help as many people as we can. Part of what we do in that respect is try to think proactively about issues that we should be looking at as a commission. So when we get charges in raising those issues, we can really be on top of them and sometimes help move the law forward. So one priority over the last eight years has been pay equity issues. I'm sure it'll come to no shock to you that there are pay disparity issues for women. Sometimes it's plain old, you're doing the same job as a man and getting paid less, and we bring a lot of those cases. Sometimes it's the occupational segregation. You know, jobs that are male-dominated often pay more than jobs that are female-dominated. Uh, women, quote unquote, self-select into those women-dominated positions. Well, sometimes yes, but sometimes because they can't get in to the male-dominated positions. We have a number of lawsuits that we have brought. In fact, one that got settled um, yesterday, but I didn't see the press release yet on our website. So if you go to EEOC.gov, you'll see it. Um, if you follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter, at Heifelbloom or Facebook, you'll see me posting it by the end of today, probably. So do a lot of that work. The other thing we have done a lot of work on is pregnancy discrimination. I cannot tell you how much discrimination there still is straight out. The woman says she's pregnant, and then suddenly she's out of the job. But the piece that we really started to focus on a few years ago was accommodations for pregnant workers, especially in lower income jobs, jobs that have manual labor. The rule that employers had was that if you were injured on the job, you could get light duty. But if you were pregnant and you needed light duty, you didn't get the light duty. And we felt that was illegal under the law. The courts had not ruled that way. We pushed that argument, and ultimately, actually, the Supreme Court agreed with us. So, so these are a number of the issues. With all of these, as you can see, we're doing it through our enforcement authority, right? Taking in charges, investigating them, settling them, bringing lawsuits, which we have the right to do, all enforcement. But when I came on the commission in 2010, which was the same time as my Republican colleague, Vicki Lipnick, came on, we were both appalled and shocked, and maybe we shouldn't have been shocked, but we were, at the extent of harassment that we saw going on around the country. And it's not just sex-based harassment. Most of our, 47% of our charges are sex-based harassment. Race-based harassment, 35%. When we are going to use this moment, which we are going to, with the focus on sex-based harassment in our country, shame on us if we don't also use it as the opportunity to make changes in our workplaces to stop harassment on all bases. Because it is happening. And the solutions to changing it are the same, so long as we put it in the mix right up front. But it was clear to both me and Vicki that enforcement was not doing enough. And not that it wasn't important, but we needed more. We needed a way to do prevention. So what we did in 2015 was pull together a task force on the study of harassment in the workplace. And we very carefully chose the members of that task force, 16 members, a third Lawyers representing employers, either actually management lawyers or working for employer associations. A third, lawyers representing employees, again, plaintiff lawyers as well as those from associations. And a third from academia, people who had been studying harassment for years in sociology, psychology, organizational behavior, etc. Because our goal was to create a space for lawyers that did not often talk to each other 
to think creatively about ways to prevent harassment before it rose to the level of illegal harassment, prevent bad conduct before it reaches the legal standard of being pervasive. So to talk with each other, come up with creative ideas, and have that group of lawyers hear from academics, whom I tell you lawyers do not usually talk to academics. <laughs> So bring them all together so we could come up with creative ideas. And a quote from James Baldwin that I heard towards the end of the process, but we then put in early on in the report, was from James Baldwin, which was, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I will tell you, when we issued that report in June 2016, if you had asked me what the biggest roadblock was to getting the recommendations out there and implemented, I would have said, getting people to pay attention. Well, guess what? <laughs> people are paying attention now, right? That is one of the things in terms of Post Weinstein and any number of other people and the Me Too movement now having people's attention. Well. Here are some things our country needs to face. Over 60% of women say they have experienced sex-based harassment at some point in their career, 60%. Now, most of those women don't even call that sexual harassment. And here's how we know that. In surveys, national surveys, that ask, have you experienced sexual harassment at some point in your career, 25% of women say yes, one out of four, right, without defining sexual harassment. If the survey lists a set of behaviors and says, have you experienced any of these behaviors, which is sort of sexually tinged attention or sexual coercion, 40% of women say yes. So look at the number that aren't even calling that unwelcome behavior sexual harassment. And if the survey also includes behaviors that are simply sexist, right, like sexually crude behavior in the workplace, pornography, or just, you know, women don't belong here, but the researchers say the put downs as well as the come ons, 60% of women say they've experienced that. That's a problem. Here's the other thing to face. Most women never file legal charges. Only 15% of women ever come to the EOC and file a charge. And I will tell you, a full third of our charges include harassment charges, sex as well as other charges. And yet, only 15% of people are coming forward. Here's to me an even more striking and disturbing figure. Almost 70% of women never even report internally. They don't use their HR process, they don't talk to a supervisor, they don't talk to a union steward, they stay silent. And they endure the harassment, or they downplay it. Oh, it's not such a big deal. They talk to family and friends, and if they can, they leave. And the reason they don't report is fear. Fear of not being believed, fear of being blamed. Well, let's talk about what you were doing in this interaction. <laughs> or, Basically, fear of retaliation, professional or social. And they're not wrong, because when the surveys ask of those who have reported, have you experienced retaliation, over half of them say yes. So why would you report? Can you imagine if a national survey was done three years from now and that percentage had plummeted of the number of folks who had reported and not been retaliated against? That would create the positive feedback loop that we need, as opposed to the negative feedback loop we have right now. So the last thing we have to face as a country is that employers for far too long have chosen to deal with what we call in the report the superstar harasser. And what we mean by that is the person of high value in that organization whether it's because of money they bring in, or fame, or visibility. Employers, when there have been complaints of harassment lodged against those folks, employers have made the cost-benefit analysis that it is better not to bring discipline against that person, but to fire or pay off the person who complained. 
Now, by the way, the research shows that's wrong, that long-term keeping a toxic worker in the workplace costs you more in terms of productivity, reputational harm, et cetera, but that cost-benefit analysis has to change, and I think it is beginning to. So these are the things we need to face, but what are we gonna do now to change it? Well, here are three overarching recommendations from the report. One, change workplace culture. The common collective understanding of a workplace has to be that it is not okay to engage in harassment. That the person who's doing it gets looked at askance. Something is said to that person. Hey, this is ha not how we operate here. Now, it's not easy to change workplace culture, but it is possible for leaders to do that. This is what the research shows. Here's what leaders need to do. Number one, they need to actually believe that harassment is wrong and they don't want it in their workplaces, okay? Beliefs and values are foundational. And maybe for the ones who don't feel it in their gut yet, maybe their concern about being on the front page of the New York Times or their local newspaper might now help them feel it. But it's really best if they feel it. Two, they have to articulate it. Do not underestimate the power of words. Having, if you have an all staff meeting on something, you know, having nothing to do with harassment, and the leader starts by reinforcing the expectations of the workplace in terms of respect, that makes a difference. But third, the employees have to feel that the leaders are authentic. Leaders say a lot of things. The leaders have to act in a way that the employees believe that they mean what they say. Which leads to the second recommendation, hold people accountable. The most important action leaders can take to demonstrate their authenticity is to hold people accountable. And there are actually three separate groups of people who have to be held accountable. The first, obviously, anyone who has been found to have engaged in harassment after a full, fair, timely investigation to have engaged in harassment has to experience proportionate discipline. If you have a situation of egregious conduct and the person gets a slap on the wrist, that will send a message very clearly that the leaders are not authentic. But proportionality is key. I, in the report, have concerns with the term zero tolerance policy. For this reason, we like the fact that you want to communicate that there is zero tolerance for any unwelcome behavior. Doesn't have to be egregious yet, just any unwelcome behavior you want to nip it in the bud. But that doesn't mean that every act of misconduct results in termination. Because employees will not only correctly perceive that as an unfair system, it might even chill reporting, because often people don't want their coworker to be fired, they just want the conduct to stop. So they need to understand there will be quick investigation and then proportionate discipline. Second group, supervisors and managers who are supposed to respond to reports of harassment. If you have a supervisor or manager who trivializes a complaint or dismisses it, that person has to be held accountable. If you have HR doing that, HR folks need to be held accountable. It makes me crazy when I hear people say, well, be careful about HR, you know, they're just protecting the employer. And I'm like, hello, the leaders need to say to HR, protecting the employer means taking in complaints seriously and doing something about them, not sweeping it under the rug. And the third group that has to be held accountable, anyone who engages in retaliation. That is the only way we're gonna create that positive feedback loop. Anyone who retaliates professionally or socially against someone who has reported harassment or um, corroborated harassment in an investigation, if they engage in retaliation, they have to be held accountable. And finally, the third recommendation, have the right policies, procedures, and training. Now, if you don't have leadership and you don't have accountability, it doesn't matter what you have in policies, procedures, and training. But if you have leadership and accountability, then those three elements round out your comprehensive harassment prevention effort. 
So let me say a few words on each. The policy. Policy should be short, clear, easy to understand. It should not be overly legalistic. And when I talk to management lawyers, I say that like three times. Employees don't need to know the legal standard of what is sexual harassment, racial harassment. They need to know, here's the conduct that will not be accepted. Here's what you do if you experience that conduct. Here's what will happen afterwards. And we will make sure there's not retaliation. That's the policy. The procedures for reporting and investigation, they need to be well resourced. So there's actually money to do timely investigations. Very hard sometimes to get leaders to put that money in up front and it's key. The second thing is it needs to take people seriously. Now that doesn't mean when someone comes with a report that you automatically assume what the person has said is true. That's what the investigation is for. But it means saying to the person who has come forward, thank you. Thank you for coming forward. If what you say is happening, that is wrong, and we will stop it. And here are the next steps. That's taking someone seriously. That's treating the person with respect. And finally, training. Training is incredibly important. But it's not the primary effort, certainly not the only effort. It is the effort that people seem to go to first. Oh, we'll do more training. No, training is the capstone effort. If you have leadership and accountability and a good policy and good procedures, then training is designed to tell people about that. And we talk about three different types of training. One, which is sort of more the traditional training. We call it compliance training, not because you just do it to comply with the law and check it off, but we got this name from one of our management lawyers who does a lot of training, and he said when he goes in and starts training, he says at the beginning, this is not training to change your mind, this is training to keep your job, or training not to be disciplined on the job, right? This is what you need to comply with at this workplace, because you are not gonna change people's attitudes or beliefs in a two-hour training. So the person who says, well, what's wrong with telling Susan she looks sexy in that dress? My wife loves it when I say it. And you're like, okay, go home, say it to your wife. Probably need to say it to her more often. But when you walk in the doors of this workplace, this is what's okay and not okay. That's the point of that type of training. And then also to explain to people where you go to report, what will happen next. But there are two other types of training that we highlight in the report that we really elevated one and almost came up with the other in terms of the workplace. So the one that we elevated was what's called work, respectful workplaces training. So the compliance training is still focused on particular statuses, race, sex, religion, LGBT status, et cetera, saying these are things we will not accept in this workplace which is very important, which is why I say, don't let's just have sexual harassment training. That type of compliance training should go across the board. Let people understand what's not gonna be okay. But respectful workplaces takes a different approach and simply, it's a very skills-based training. It creates a sense of collective incentive to have a fair, respectful workplace and then skills-based in that if you get a comment or behavior that feels disrespectful, to know how to give feedback about that, to know how to say something in the moment. And if you get that feedback, to know how to respond. I mean, we don't do these well as human beings, either of them. And there's something about having the employer have trainings that says, this is the type of workplace we want, and here are the skills for doing it. The second type of new type of training is bystander intervention training. And I love when I hear people talking about this now, because we really found out about this training by what was going on in college campuses. 
And then we highlighted the idea of trying to move this to the workplace. So this is not as common in workplaces yet. Respectful workplaces training, there were any number of vendors who were doing that. But so bystander intervention training, also very skills-based. Again, the first piece of the training, create a sense of collective responsibility for intervening when one sees harassment. People do not like seeing harassment happening around them. But either they feel it's not their problem, or they feel helpless. They don't know what to do, and they're afraid if they do intervene, that they'll be the next target. So this is skills-based training that says, here are some realistic options for intervening. And realistic because there are different power dynamics in a workplace than there are on college campuses. And you're all students, let's say. So realistic options. So it can be simply confronting the person in the moment. The person says something in an off-color joke. And the person right in the moment says, you know what, I didn't, I didn't appreciate that. Right? An off-color racial joke, but it's a white person who says, I didn't appreciate that. Right, an off-color sexist joke, but it's a man who says, I didn't appreciate that. But of course, that requires some power dynamics that are equal, right, between the folks. It might be not saying anything in the moment, but going to the person afterwards and saying, can we talk about that? Because that made me uncomfortable, right? So it's still a direct intervention, but in a more private setting. It might be simply going to someone else who can do something about it. Right, if the power dynamics are such that you can't do a direct intervention. Or it might be simply going to the person who was the target of the touching that you saw or the comment and say, did that make you uncomfortable? And if so, can we talk about how I can help you do something about it? All of these are simple bystander interventions, but people have to feel, number one, that their leadership wants them to do that, that they will be told thank you when they come forward, and they have to be protected against retaliation. So here's my feeling about where we are at the moment. Right? We are at a moment with regard to harassment. We can see it, we can feel it, we can hear it. The question is whether we are going to leverage this moment to create significant and sustainable change. That's our challenge. And the fact is, we have the attention now of the range of social actors that we need. Employers, employees, unions, government agencies, foundations, the media, the common person on the street. We have the attention. Now we need to work strategically using the roadmap that I just described to actually make change. I think we can do it. So let's do it. Let's just do it. Thank you. <laughs> and you have to look at that clock. <laughs> Oh, no, I think anonymous reporting can be essential. Now, that it has to be framed in a way that people understand the limitations of that. So if you do something anonymously, there's not going to be an investigation that's necessarily going to start. Um, I would say that um, it's definitely worth looking on our website for a commission, uh, a, a task force. We reconvene the task force in excuse me, in June, and her testimony from folks, including two people who have some very interesting apps. Okay, so one app is for an ombuds person. So you can just talk to someone through the app, explain the situation, and get advice about how to proceed without having to go to anyone officially yet in the organization. And one of the things, by the way, for reporting processes that's very important is that there be multiple places to report, you know, not just to your supervisor, not necessarily just to HR, but various places to report, because some might feel safer than others. So that's one approach with an ombuds that's totally separate from HR. 
Another, which is at the moment limited to sex-based harassment, so I'd like to see it expanded, but it's more an escrow system. So you can report a case of harassment by someone, so you're naming the person, but you're staying anonymous. If someone else reports about that same person, then that app will put the two of you together. So then you have some sense, because there is absolutely safety in numbers. But again, neither of those necessarily starts an investigation. Now, if the employer is the one that's doing that sort of what's called escrow reporting, right, keeping it in escrow, if they get three reports about the same person, even if the folks who are then put with each other decide they don't want to come, come forward, the employer can decide, hmm, maybe I will go do an investigation of this person's division. And then they're talking to people in that division can they, and if they reassure people about no retaliation, if people are not, they can say then, all right, there were four people who said this, you know, in the investigation that they initiated. So it's not like the person felt they were coming forward and being the troublemaker, et cetera. They were being asked, can you tell me what's going on? Then they can go to the person who's engaging their conduct. And again, it's proportionate. The message has to be sent to folks. It doesn't have to be egregious sex-based harassment or racial harassment or disability-based harassment for us not to want it in our workplace, right? It may not expose us, the employer, to legal liability yet, because it's not severe enough or it hasn't been happening enough, but we want to stop it before it rises to that level. So if that's the message that's sent to employees to say you will be helping us if you tell us what's happening, that's a completely different feeling. It's like saying to folks, we want a safe workplace, right? Safe, you know, in terms of no physical harm, right? Of course, people come forward, they're applauded if they come forward and say that machine, they should be applauded if they come forward and say that machine is, is now dangerous. Which is also, by the way, a big issue we find is that people come forward, let's say to a supervisor, and says, I want to tell you this is happening, but I don't want you to do anything. Now, if you say that to a coworker, that's fine. The coworker has no legal responsibility to say anything. Hopefully, if they're feeling empowered as a bystander, they'll talk about why it could make sense to come forward. Um, you know, they can even be the one that comes forward and says, it's someone in this division. That person doesn't want to come forward, but if you could come forward yourself, HR or whoever else, and talk to folks, that'd be helpful. But if the person says that to a supervisor or manager, that person legally has the responsibility to investigate. Now, if it's low level, they can say to the person, here are some tools for addressing it directly yourself. Let's try that first. If that works, great. But if it's too egregious of conduct, they have to say, I have an obligation to now investigate. It's like if you came forward and said, well, that machine is faulty. Oh, but don't say that I said that because the boss will be angry. You're like, no, other people could get hurt. And that's the same thing here with harassment. If you're getting harassed, there might be other people getting harassed. We have an obligation to move forward, to try to do something. But that's why making sure people aren't retaliated against is so key. And it's not just what sometimes happens after an investigation, after something has happened, to say, let me, let me know if you have any problems. No, it's I'm gonna come forward and check to see if there are any problems. You know, the, the leadership, the employer, has to feel the one being responsible for making sure there's no retaliation. Yes. Right, and so social retaliation, right, would be the person of who harassment has been complained of is still in the job, and let's put a pin in the question of when someone's still in the job, they've been disciplined in some way, but no one knows that. Okay, so let's put a pin in that. So the person is still on the job. That person had friends 
right? The person who complained is seen as the troublemaker, is now ostracized, you know, things are happening to that person. And they can be subtle. They can also be pretty blatant, but that's gotta be something that the person comes forward and says, this is what's happening. Okay, so this is where I get to holding accountable the people who have engaged in retaliation, which means the leadership has to come in, if that's happening, to say, this is not okay in this workplace. And if we have evidence, and we'll do an investigation about retaliation, if we have evidence, we're gonna take some action. Now, they're not gonna be happy about that. And the first set of times when that happens, that's not gonna be good. But that actually does then send a message for the next time and the next time. Now, the best is if you have, that's why I start with workplace culture. If you have a culture in which it is understood that it helps everyone when someone comes forward with a complaint, then you're less likely to get that social retaliation. I've talked a lot to unions, and I say to them, number one, the union steward is like the manager, right? When that person gets a complaint, they can't dismiss it, trivialize it, they can't blame the person for complaining about a co-union member. They have to be trained to say, thank you for coming forward. And that union steward, that manager, is the one that has to say to folks, I'm glad this person came forward. And it's not about squealing on a coworker. And again, to the extent that it's at low level stuff, so the person isn't fired, right, but is just disciplined, that can hopefully then, you know, reduce the, the sense of anger from the others. Again, this is not easy. This is not happening overnight. No way. But it's about starting down the road to that and reinforcing in trainings before there's any actual situation, right? In training, saying this is what we want as a workplace and giving accolades to those who respond correctly. Doesn't just have to be discipline in the accountability. But this, this is one of the hardest nuts to crack. So often what happens is someone engages in egregious conduct, they actually are terminated, but it's never said that's what they were fired for. You know, and there's a press release about how the wonderful service they gave to the company and you know, best wishes on their next job. That's not sending a good message. And often, the person is still in the same position. They are disciplined. They might get docked some pay or whatever, but that's never told to the person who complained. I talk to HR people and I say, do you tell them what you did? And they're like, oh my God, no, privacy, privacy. We just say that we, you reported, we've investigated, we've dealt with it appropriately. Thank you for sharing. I mean, it's not gonna feel good to the person. And I say to them, there is no privacy law that stops you from saying what was done. You might want to just tell the person, it's not like you have to trumpet it in terms of the person's name, but you must show what it is that you did. I, I don't know, this is gonna take a while to change what I call the standard of care. Right, in, you know, and it's talking to the general counsels, it's talking to the HR people, it's talking to the CEO to say we need to change the default here. Yes, HR, usually personnel issues, private, confidential, I'm all about that. <laughs> Not on this. And then I say, and you need to feel comfortable about your decision. One HR person said, well, so we just docked the person's pay for two weeks and the person comes forward and says, well, they should have been fired you know, after they're told. I said, well, you should feel comfortable standing behind your decision, because if the person should have been fired, <laughs> you better have some good answer if all you did was dock them two weeks pay. But if you feel based on the facts, yeah, that person might feel he should get fired, but he shouldn't. That's not what proportionate discipline means. And then you stand behind that. Great question. So one of the things we say, 
Oh, sure. Um, so if an agency decides that it does want to make some changes, okay, it starts off, what are the metrics that that agency should use to show that they are, in fact, moving the needle? So one of the things we say in the report, and um, I want to suggest, if you want to read the report, we spend a lot of time making it very accessible. <laughs> and just Google EOC harassment report. Don't even try to navigate our website. Go to Mama Google, EOC harassment report, you'll get right to it. <laughs> and if you do EOC harassment task force, you'll get to the page with all of the meetings and some very interesting testimony. One of the things we say is the metric should not be how many complaints is coming from a particular division. Because that creates some incentive for a manager, subtle and not so subtle, to make sure there aren't complaints. So you actually want to see an increase in complaints first, before you see the downtick. Um, I remember being at, speaking at a panel, and they did you know, one of those automatic on your phone responses to things, and it was all, it was like 200 corporate compliance officers, um, which I had never even known there were such people in corporate America, but they're actually key people. They're the ones that are responsible for compliance, usually with financial compliance laws. But they're also the ones that put out the company's code of conduct, ethical code of conduct, which, boy, we should get in there in terms of an ethical code of conduct being no harassment. But the question was, has there been an increase in internal reporting in your company? And about a quarter of the folks, maybe a little bit over a quarter, said yes. And it was like, they asked, small uptick, large uptick. Some of them had small, some of them you know, had more significant. And the first thing I said when I talked was, congratulations to all of you companies that have seen an uptick. Because that means you are communicating a sense of safety to folks. And I don't want them ever coming to the EOC. I'd like them to be reported internally and dealt with internally. So what's not something is the uptick in complaints initially. You'd like to see an uptick. Then ultimately, you'd like to see a downtick from whatever that high was. But the other way to do it is through climate surveys, cultural assessment surveys. These are anonymous surveys, goes out to folks, can say, have you experienced harassment? Or, because the general counsels don't like when you ask that question, you can, because it feels it might put them at legal risk. Oh, there has been harassment. We haven't done something. But you can ask things like, if you experienced harassment, would you know where to go to? If you experienced harassment, would you know that there are multiple ways to report? Would you feel safe in reporting? I mean, lots of other questions you can ask, and you see that increase going up, that's your metric. The other thing, by the way, you know, making the business case to agency heads, and I call it the business case because it's still about running your agency well, they tend to think that the only cost is the financial cost of defending a lawsuit and paying out money, that's the least of the costs. That is one direct financial cost. But much higher are the indirect financial costs. And its impact on the physical and mental health, not just on the target, but the research shows people who see harassment going unchecked, experience mental and physical consequences resulting in absenteeism, healthcare costs, reduction in productivity, again, of both the target and folks around them. Biggest cost, job turnover. Because if people can leave, they leave. And that, again, is not just the target, but some skilled, talented employee not being harassed, but it's like, I don't want to hang out here. And remember, most people don't report, so agencies might be losing talented people and never know it was because of harassment. And finally, reputational harm. And reputational harm, what's relevant to an agency is it can stop other talented employees from coming to that agency or that division. For companies, it's also they can lose clients and customers. And of course, huge reputational harm if it gets into the media. But even without the media, word gets out. 
So all of these are indirect costs. So if you start making changes, you should hopefully be seeing positive effects on not having absenteeism, better productivity, less job turnover, better reputation, even if you never realized that your problems before was because of unchecked harassment. Certainly when there's a superstar harasser, that's a huge problem. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the question is, is there a difference between bullying and harassment? We made that distinction in our report because we decided that although we were going to be focused on prevention and not the legal definition of harassment, we would focus on unwelcome behavior based on a protected characteristic. So unwelcome behavior based on sex or race or religion, and that we weren't going to also cover bullying, because bullying is basically uncivil, disrespectful behavior that is uniformly applied <laughs> to people. <laughs> Black, white, men, women, it's just the supervisor is bullying, or a coworker is. One of the things we discovered, though, which is why we recommend respectful workplaces training, is as one researcher said to us, uncivil behavior can be a gateway drug to illegal harassment. So if you really want to change the workplace and to do it in a more positive way, instead of here's what you should not do, it's a positive, here's the type of workplace we want. And that's why the skills training is so important because sometimes you're being bullied and you don't really know how to come back and say something, right? The person who said something totally rude may not have realized how it came out for some people, right? So to know how to take in that feedback to say, oh, thank you. I didn't, I didn't realize how that was affecting you. Now, people don't usually say that especially if they really are a bully. So part of the skills training is if you're a manager of someone who is bullying, <laughs> to do something about that. And also to have people understand what's not bullying. Okay, to be told, excuse me, this is three days late, and you never called to tell me that, and that's said in a harsh tone, that's not bullying. To me, that's management. Okay, now if you are only harsh with black people and not white people, right, there you've got a problem. Or if you're giving that feedback in a way that's completely unnecessarily bullying to everyone, that's not good for the workplace. But not every time you're told you're not doing your job is that bullying. And I think that's important in a respectful workplace's training to make clear. So there is a difference, partly because unwelcome behavior based on those protected characteristics, if it rises to a certain level, will be illegal. And there is nothing illegal, unfortunately, or for whatever. There is nothing illegal about being a complete total jerk. Um, so there is that distinction. But I think in terms of prevention, it is worth thinking about stopping bullying and being affirmative about a respectful workplace. Yeah, good last question. Yes, what a great question to end on. So number one, and this is very easy to get on our EOC, on the homepage, eoc.gov. We have basically what we've done in the past year. Essentially, we wanted to mark it by October from the Weinstein, you know, um, blow up, whatever. Um, and we have our enforcement, and we have our outreach, education, prevention, and then we have what have we done internally. So one, we revised our policy to match that we have a checklist at the end of the report. Here are the elements of a good policy. I will tell you, you know, the policy was negotiated over a year and some with the union, and I got it after that, and it was 33 pages. And I'm like, have you read the report? Okay, it's supposed to be a simple, easy to understand. So we now have, we worked on a five-page policy 
that goes to all the employees, and then we have 25 pages of procedures. It's not that those procedures aren't important, they just don't need to be part of the policy. So we did that. Second, we are rolling out the Respectful Workplaces training for all of our employees. So the first thing we did is we had suggested Respectful Workplaces training, we then put our money where our mouth is, and EOC doesn't have a lot of money, but we contracted with someone to come up with that Respect for Workplaces training, and so that's being rolled out. Um, and then we've trained our investigators, a three-day training. That's really about them taking in the complaints, but to me, that's like training your supervisors and managers about how to respond. Some of those are similar in terms of the training. Have we done enough? I don't think so because it's a multi-year project. And certainly when I rotate off in January, I'm going to have my eyes on the EOC, <laughs> seeing what's happening. So look, like I, it, it is, it's on all of us, right? It's everything I've said here, this is about all of you, not only in your jobs, but as citizens of the world, in terms of getting out, in terms of this message. So I am thrilled to have been able to talk to all of you. <laughs> the DC person. <laughs> oh, <I think. laughs>